Greetings to all lovers of tales, myths, and legends. Well, it's been a while since we last ventured into the realm of the Greek gods on Mount Olympus. I think today is the perfect time. And the protagonist of our story will be the radiant Apollo, also known as Phoebus, which means the shining one. The most unpredictable god of Olympus, some call him the merciless destroyer, as he brings diseases upon those who lead an unjust life. Others, on the contrary, venerate him as a healer and believe in his ability to predict the future. Additionally, this golden-haired Olympian is revered as the god of the sun and the patron of the muses. Every spring, Apollo descends to the forest-covered slopes of Mount Helicon with a golden lyre in his hands, where he is greeted by nine beautiful muses. Together, they journey to Mount Parnassus, where they engage in joyful dances around the Castalian Spring. Moreover, Apollo is revered as the protector of the arts, exiles, and shepherds. So who is Apollo? And how did he come to be on Olympus? It all started when the mighty thunderer Zeus fell in love with the beautiful goddess Leto. However, Zeus' wife Hera discovered this affair, and naturally, she was displeased. Furthermore, Leto was already expecting a child from Zeus. This enraged Hera, and as an offended wife, she decided to punish the lovely goddess by devising a terrible curse. Henceforth, Leto could not set foot on solid ground and could not stay in one place for long. And to ensure the young goddess couldn't defy her, Hera sent a malevolent and dreadful dragon named Python after her. Initially, Leto tried to hide from her pursuer, but wherever she went, he found her. Thus, she found herself on Delos, a small floating island that freely roamed the open sea. As soon as the fugitive took a step, two enormous pillars rose from the depths of the dark abyss, anchoring the floating island in place. Delos was gloomy, unwelcoming, and desolate, but she had no choice. Exhausted and weakened, she reached the nearest tree and immediately gave birth to her son, the epitome of divine beauty, Apollo. Everything around suddenly shone, flowers bloomed, lifeless rocks became covered in green grass, and the sea radiated a welcoming light. Following Apollo, his sister Artemis was born. Thus, Delos became the home of Apollo and Artemis. Apollo grew not by days, but by hours, and soon he transformed into a magnificent, mighty youth. He resolved to avenge the malevolent dragon that had tormented his mother. Taking his silver bow, he flew to Delphi. In the vicinity of the city, the wicked python dwelled, tormenting the local inhabitants. And so, the golden-haired god reached the lair of the dragon, a gloomy, dark, and damp chasm. Everything around rattled and roared. From its den emerged a gigantic dragon, covered in black scales. It rose to its full height, opened its enormous, tooth-filled mouth, and let out a terrifying, thunderous roar that echoed throughout the surroundings. But Apollo was not afraid, instead, he raised his silver bow. Arrows flew one after another towards the enraged monster. Python fell lifeless right back into its den, never to rise again. Proud of his victory over the slain Python, Apollo stood, when suddenly he noticed Eros, the young god of love, not far from him. Eros was also stringing his bow toward the defeated monster. Apollo smirked and said, Why does such a young lad need such a dangerous weapon? Give it to me, and you can go back to your games. Look at the monster I vanquished, can you compare yourself to me? Arrow slightly smiled and, deciding to punish the braggart, said. I know that your arrows never miss their mark, but even you cannot escape my arrow. He flapped his little wings and soared into the sky. He took out two arrows, one that strikes directly at the heart and arouses love, which he aimed at Apollo, and the other, which repels love, aimed at Daphne, the daughter of the river god Peneus. Time passed, and Apollo had already forgotten his encounter with Eros and continued living as before. Daphne had noticed nothing. She also frolicked with her friends in blooming meadows, danced and reveled. Many tried to win her love and favor, but none succeeded. She rejected everyone and allowed no one to come close. 
Old Punius had become worried and started lecturing his daughter, urging her to have children. To this, Daphne replied with laughter, Do not force me, father. I love no one. I want to remain a perpetual maiden like Artemis. Punius didn't understand what was happening, and neither did Daphne, that it was the cunning arrows to blame. One sunny day, Apollo flew past a forest glade where Daphne was walking. As soon as he saw the beautiful nymph, the wound inflicted by Eros made itself known. Apollo fell deeply in love with Daphne. Descending to the ground, he boldly approached his newfound beloved nymph. But as soon as she noticed him, she immediately started running as fast as she could. Apollo tried to call out to her, but to no avail. The beautiful nymph ran away, paying no attention to him. You don't know who you're running from, he shouted after her, I am the son of Zeus, Apollo. But Daphne seemed not to hear him. Apollo then chased after her. Sensing that her pursuer was about to catch her, Daphne pleaded to her father. Help me, let the earth open up and take me, let my form change, for it only brings me suffering. As soon as she said that, her body stiffened, her arms turned into branches of supple laurel, and leaves immediately sprouted from them. Her legs became roots and merged with the ground. Apollo remained standing beside the laurel, filled with sorrow. He stood there for a long time and finally said, Since you did not wish to become my wife, beautiful Daphne, at least be my tree. May your foliage never wither, and let the crown of your leaves adorn my head. Since then, Apollo loved to wander through shady groves accompanied by his young muses. Apollo didn't mourn for long. His father, the great and mighty Zeus, summoned him and said, My son, we have a custom on Olympus. Those who have committed a killing must cleanse the blood from their hands. And if I remember correctly, you killed Python. Thus, by the decree of Zeus, Apollo had to go to Thessaly and serve King Admetus, noble and wise. Apollo lived at Admetus' court and served him faithfully and justly, redeeming his sin. Admetus ordered the god to tend his herds and take care of the livestock. Since then, Apollo became a shepherd. During this time, not a single bull went missing from the herd, and the horses became the best in all of Thessaly. But one day Apollo noticed that Admetus was troubled. He neither ate nor drank and constantly walked around in a pensive and downcast state. Soon, the reason for the king's sorrow became known. It turned out that he had fallen madly in love with the beautiful Alcestis, and she reciprocated his feelings. However, there was a problem. Alcestis' father, King Peleus of Iolcus, had set impossible conditions. He promised to give his daughter in marriage only to the man who arrived to claim her in a chariot pulled by a wild boar and a lion. Admetus was not one to shy away from challenges, nature had endowed him with strength. But he couldn't fathom how to fulfill such a condition. In his opinion, it was simply impossible. And so, he wandered in contemplation with a despondent mind. Apollo decided to come to the aid of the lovestruck king and, with the words that there is nothing in this world that cannot be accomplished, touched Admetus' shoulder. Immediately, Admetus felt an extraordinary surge of strength and confidence in his success. Inspired, Admetus set off into the forest, where he easily captured a wild boar and a lion, and then harnessed them to his chariot. On this chariot, he arrived at Peleus' court, leaving the king with no choice but to keep his word and give his daughter in marriage to Admetus. Apollo served in Thessaly for eight years, redeeming his sin, and then returned to the peak of Mount Parnassus to join the company of the beautiful muses. Meanwhile, while Apollo enjoyed his well-deserved rest, let us venture into the forests of Phrygia, where an unsuspecting and cheerful satyr named Marcius, by chance, found a reed flute and soon learned to play it skillfully. He played so well that everyone around was captivated by his music. But could Marcius have known that this flute had previously belonged to Athena, the goddess of wisdom? She had crafted it herself and enjoyed playing it in her free time. 
However, one day she discarded the flute, believing that it marred her beautiful face. At that moment, she uttered these words. Cursed be the one who finds and raises this flute. Meanwhile, our jolly satyr became filled with pride and boasted about his playing to everyone around him. Unbeknownst to him, he accidentally challenged Apollo to a musical contest. The radiant god was angered by the satyr's challenge, but he concealed his emotions and simply appeared at the contest. Midas served as the judge, being sympathetic to Marcius in spirit and taste, and awarded him the victory. However, Apollo then played the lyre and sang, after which Marcius lost the competition. In response, Apollo hung Marcius by his hands on a tall pine tree, so he would never be able to play the flute again. Although there is another version where the punishment was more bloodthirsty, and Midas was rewarded with donkey ears for his judgment. Such was Apollo, the most unpredictable god of Olympus. To avoid angering the gods, leave your comments and watch other videos on the channel. Subscribe to stay up to date with events on Olympus, Asgard, and other mythological realms. That's all for now. Thank you for your attention and see you in new videos.